Hello. Hello. Um, many thanks to all of you for attending uh, today's lecture. During the time I was um, conducting my research uh, for the Frick's upcoming exhibition that will open um, in November 16, so in a little bit less than two weeks. And the title of this exhibition is Pierre Gautier, Virtuose Gilder at the French Court. And so when I was traveling uh, for this exhibition, I went to Windsor Castle to explore the, the wealth of the French guild bronze uh, objects in the royal collection. And it was there that I met for the first time Rufus Bird. And as he guided me through the sumptuous apartments and this amazing collection of objects, I was reminded how lucky I am as a curator, not only to see extraordinary objects every day, but also to meet amazing people such as Rufus and to have the privilege of form forming long lasting relationship with them. Today, Rufus will talk generally about the objects in the royal collections and more specifically about the fascination with Asian porcelain and gilbons shared by French patrons of the 18th century who commissioned such luxurious objects as those we hope that you will come back and see um, at the Frick in November in this uh, Gautier exhibition. Before we have the pleasure to, of hearing Rufus, a few words about him. Since 2010, he has been deputy sur uh, surveyor of the Queen's Works of Art at the Royal Collection Collections Trust, a department of the Royal Household. Previously, he worked for many years at Christie's, becoming a director in charge of English furniture in 2008. In 2014, he curated the exhibition The First Georgians at the Queen's Gallery in London. In 2015, he became a member of the Council for the Furniture History Society. He contributed to the catalog of Chinese and Japanese works of art in the collection of the Majesty or Queen, and which was actually published just this year. It's a beautiful volume, and I really encourage you to um, have a look at it and even acquire it. He is a graduate of Peter House at Cambridge University, where he studied history of art. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me my great pleasure to welcome Morpheus Bird. Thank you, Charlotte. That was very kind. And um, may I say how, uh, what a great pleasure it is to be here in New York uh, speaking about um, mounted Asian porcelains uh, uh, this evening. So, um, thank you. This evening, uh, this talk has evolved out of work undertaken in connection with the publication, as Charlotte mentioned, of the catalogue raisonné of Chinese and Japanese works of art in the collection of Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, which is um, crossing the Atlantic currently on its way here to uh, the US and will be available in December through the University of Chicago Press. And over recent years, I've spent time, perhaps not enough time actually, thinking and reading about mounted porcelain. The catalogue comprises some 2,000 objects, of which about 200 uh, porcelains and lacquers are mounted in metal, mainly in gilt bronze, but also in silver gilt. The literature on the subject is not broad, but I have benefited from and gratefully acknowledge important studies undertaken in recent years by Stefan Castelluccio, Gillian Wilson of the Getty, and Crystal Smentek, who organized an important exhibition here at the Frick in 2007 and wrote a valuable and stimulating accompanying publication. While the British Royal Collection of these rare and exotic objects is a large group, probably the largest of any, uh, other notable and important groups exist in other collections, foremost being that in Munich, uh, formed by the electors of Bavaria in the first half of the 18th century, and also groups in, in other important collections of decorative arts, such as the Wallace Collection, the Rothschild Collection at Wadston Manor, the Lassels Collection at Harvard House in Yorkshire in England, the Getty, the Huntington Library in California, and of course, the Frick and the Met here in New York. Uh, and we cannot forget uh, the French national collections at the Louvre and Versailles. So it's a very broadly spread group of objects. What I want to explore today is a response to several simple questions. What are mounted porcelains? 
How and why did they come to be? What is their story? And as I've spent some of the last six years thinking and writing about these objects, what follows is a sort of explanation of the value and fascination which these pieces hold. Now, at this point, I, I must confess that I've, in fact, not included lacquers in my uh, talk. Um, so I apologize here if, if any mounted lacquer enthusiasts uh, are here tonight. Um, but I'd be very delighted to discuss the subject uh, with anyone uh, interested. So mounted Asian porcelains have been of enduring fascination to collectors since porcelain appeared in Western Europe in the 13th and 14th centuries. And as it's well known, the earliest documented piece of Chinese porcelain in Europe is the so-called Genier Fontel vase, which I'm showing you here. Uh, and we know this uh, from this engraving here of 1713, uh, when it belonged to Roger de Genier, and we know that it was given in 1381 by Louis the Great of Hungary to Charles I of Durazzo. But perhaps even before this, it almost certainly belonged to Charles IV, uh, who had died in 1378, King of Bohemia, whose 700th anniversary was celebrated this year in a series of exhibitions in Prague, including the rare loan of the vase itself from the National Museum of Ireland. The vase had been stripped of its medieval silver, counts, uh, silver mounts after 1823 when it was sold by William Beckford. Such an object um, uh, and its succession of collector owners has made it a sort of cult piece. Uh, it was rediscovered in the museum in Dublin in the middle of the 20th century uh, after it had been acquired in 1882 and the loss of its mounts only adding to the melancholy and the recent story of neglect. So this particular piece uh, will serve for us as a focal point for the first part of this discussion, as it neatly demonstrates three essential characteristics, which I think must be understood when looking at mounted porcelain. And these, I would like to suggest, are firstly, distance. These objects traveled a very long way from China or Japan, the only parts of the world which had developed the technology to produce such lustrous porcelains. Until the beginning of the 16th century, small quantities of porcelain and fairly large quantities of textiles came to Europe overland via the Silk Road. After the beginning of the 16th century, it became much easier to send these fragile goods by sea, but still they arrived in fairly small quantities until the following century, and the establishment of trading ports on mainland China and the commercial shipping companies founded to trade in these wares. Therefore, these precious objects from the East could command high prices and were generally only afforded by princes kept in treasuries. This distance, such as i.e. Their, their, their production by another strange culture, afforded these objects a quality of difference, which also underlined their rarity. When placed alongside the more numerous and readily accessible silver or hardstone objects, in 18th century France, the products of China and Japan were certainly understood and valued as separate nations, Japanese objects being valued higher than the Chinese counterparts on account of their rarity. But it seems that as far as uh, George IV was concerned, uh, we, uh, uh, so sorry, we cannot know this for certain as we don't know what was quite, um, at what he was thinking of at that point. So um, our second characteristic might be desirability, partly because of their rarity, fragility, ingenuity, preciousness, and difference. These pieces were highly desirable. They were exchanged as signifiers of a particular type of civilization. For example, in 1447, the Mamluk Sultan of Egypt sent green porcelain to Charles VII of France. And in 1461, the Sultan sent 20 porcelain vessels as a gift to Pasquale Malipiero, the Doge of Venice. And in 1487, the Florentine ruler Lorenzo de' Medici was the recipient of porcelain from the same source. These gifts, sourced through the Mamluks, uh, through their trading networks, were made partly in order to demonstrate their own civilized trading cultural network. So Asian porcelain was highly valued enough at that date to be considered appropriate as a gift between nations and a signifier of a particular type of culture. Right, here we are. At the same time, or actually very slightly later, really, uh, in the um, 15th, 16th century, uh, European princes and the formation of their Kunst or Wunderkammern included porcelain 
uh, mostly mounted in silver gilt on account of the ingenuity of man's ability to create works of art of great beauty and also as a remarkable product of nature, thereby fitting into those categories in which you form a Kunstkammer of uh, artificialia and naturalia. Uh, and these uh, categories were some of the, one of the four or five categories laid down in the various Renaissance handbooks for princes wishing to create a Kunstkammer. Alongside these porcelains, uh, which of course were few in number, uh, although it must be said Archduke Ferdinand uh, almost certainly counted a number of porcelains in his Kunstkammer at Schloss Ambras. Um, and you find here in such uh, assemblages uh, the more familiar uh, nautilus cups or hard stones or standing cups uh, which were uh, fitted with silver gilt. So Chinese porcelains, and this is the point here, took their place alongside uh, other objects of rarity, ingeniousness, and magnificence. And of course, these uh, reflected the owner's status and wealth. Now, leaping forward into the 18th century, thirdly, I would like to, con like to suggest uh, mutability. These objects are capable of adaptation. Once the pieces arrived in Europe, uh, they were very soon fitted with mounts. Uh, which immediately transformed the porcelain object from something recognizably Chinese and therefore to European eyes strange and alien into something familiar and readable. The object was now capable of incorporation as seen here uh, into a European setting. Often though this aspect I believe to be somewhat exaggerated, the porcelain vessel was cut uh, in order to accommodate uh, in order that the mounts might fit better. But as porcelain was so rare and expensive until the 17th century, most early pieces are not, in fact, cut. Uh, once mounted, the object uh, is, of course, changed. It is altered, disrupted, translated, mutated, and some might say even mutilated. Uh, however one looks at it, this quality of mutability uh, often evolved along with fashion uh, or other developments. Uh, we've already seen the unfortunate case of the Fontil vase, uh, whose silver mounts were removed, possibly melted. But mounts on porcelains were often updated, the old ones removed and new ones added, the better to conform with the fashion of the day. In other instances, old mounts were added to new, a practice especially popular in France and England in the early 19th century. So I would like to su suggest that these three qualities of distance, desirability, and mutability are all somehow inherent in each finished piece of mounted Asian porcelain. And I wanted to spend a short while discussing the evolution of these objects. The question one might ask here is, how did we get from the delicate cup here on the left, mounted in 15th century silver gilt, to the full-blown monumentality? And of course, the scale here is completely completely wrong, the full-blown um, full uh, monumentality and sculptural richness of the mounted vases on the right? Well, the short answer is the Marshal Mercier, and these were the highly inventive and creative dealers or entrepreneurs who caused these magnificent creations on the right uh, to come into being. And I think it is worth considering uh, the various inter intermediate stages. As we know, Mounted porcelain was included in the range of works considered appropriate for a Renaissance, Kunst, or Wunderkammer, or indeed a cabinet. And uh, like this example here, uh, by an unknown Flemish artist of a princely cabinet of about 1620. And it clearly shows on the right a cabinet with mounted porcelain next to some silver, and even some coral just visible behind. So mounts were added to these vessels by a goldsmith, who was very likely commissioned to add mounts to an expensive object owned by a wealthy individual or organization, such as a guild. And it seems that through the course of the 17th century, the Kunstkammer and its equivalents began to lose its preeminent position as a means of princely or educated display. And of course, they were superseded here by rooms of massed porcelain and buffets filled with plate. Uh, these were, of course, these were especially popular in Northern Europe uh, such as this example here uh, in Schloss Charlottenburg, uh, depicted here in the first decade of the 18th century. Around this time in France, um, actually a little bit earlier, 
uh, in the 17th century, uh, the precious objects which made up the so-called gemme de la couronne, literally the French crown jewels, but were in fact a group of Italian, Bohemian, antique Roman, and 17th century French mounted rock crystal and hard stone vessels, many of which were purchased by Louis XIV directly from Cardinal Mazarin in 1665 uh, and were displayed in Versailles from 1685 in the Petite Galerie. Uh, and in fact, they continued to be displayed in various different locations uh, in, um, in Versailles and subsequently in, uh, in Paris. Uh, and um, Tessin notes, um, he noted, la quantité de beaux agates garnies de diamants y est prodigieuse et l'on y voit les présents des siamois et des ambassadeurs de Chine. The quantity and of, of beautiful agates mounted with diamonds is prodigious. And there one can see presents from the Siamese and the ambassadors of China. And so this, to my mind, further underlines the common classification of these two categories of objects. While the European tradition of fitting metal mounts to Chinese porcelain, as we have seen, certainly reaches back into the early 15th century and probably earlier, I can't help but think that it was the proximity of display of these hard stone vessels, the availability of the material, and their rich princely association which provided the design source and the inspiration uh, for, subsequent, uh, for the subsequent century and the mounting of Asian porcelains and lacquers. As Carolyn Sargentson has shown in her valuable study of the Marshal Mercier, it is this class of tradesmen, not permitted actually to make anything, but to bring together disparate parts who sit at the center of almost all of Parisian luxury production. Uh, and though they were one of the oldest guilds in Paris, it was in the 18th century that they ruled supreme. No. And of course, this is a good example of the type of production that they, uh, that they were known to have made. Um, thanks to the very significant wealth of the French nobility in the 18th century, coinciding with the rise of a newly rich class of tax collectors, the fermiers généraux, and some particularly willing royal patrons and mistresses led by Madame de Pompadour, as well as the rise in imports of Chinese porcelain, the conditions were perfect for the creation of these splendid objects. So how were they created? Simply put, the porcelain was brought to Europe from China annually in Dutch, British, or French East Indies company vessels. Sales of the porcelain uh, of the cargo were held in Amsterdam, Rotterdam, Le Havre, and in other ports, and were attended by local and Parisian dealers. Sometimes secondary sales were held in Paris, at which the raw material, the porcelain, was bought, and this is the important part, by the Marshal Mercier. At this point, the merchant might commission designs for mounts, or he might develop designs in consultation with a particular client. Once the two-dimensional design was settled upon, it was then turned into a three-dimensional wooden or clay model uh, to be used as the negative in the casting process. This was then pressed into a sand box and removed. Uh, the, the brass mix heated until molten and poured into the gap. The cast piece then turned out, sent to a chaser who finished the piece using special tools. And here we are. This is the uh, workshop in the 18th century. Uh, finally, uh, the mount was sent to the gilder who applied, this is a gilding workshop, uh, as seen in Diderot's um, Encyclopédie. Uh, finally, the mount was sent to the gilder who applied one or more layers of gold leaf uh, using the highly toxic mercury fire gilding process. And the mount was then finished using certain types of stone, including agate, to provide a burnished or matted finish. Uh, many such objects were recorded in the day book of Lazare Duvaux, uh, the, the dealer, um, whose records of sales between 1748 and 1758 have survived uh, and have been much studied. Madame de Pompadour's name occurs many times uh, against purchases of mounted porcelain, and it is thought uh, that she owned a pair of carp vases rather like the pair that I showed just now. Uh, and um, I think I've got a picture of it. Uh, shown in its constituent parts. Here we are. This is uh, one of the photos, uh, one of the projects that we've done for the catalogue uh, and um, taken the mounts off and photographed them in their individual parts. Um, the Frick has fostered the study of mounted porcelain, and I refer, of course, to the pioneering study and exhibition by Crystal Smentek that I mentioned before, uh, focusing on those powder blue vases that I showed earlier. 
And before that, in fact, Ted Dell's catalog of furniture and gilt bronzes. Um, and it was Ted Dell um, who suggested that designs of the 1750s and 60s for Sèvres porcelain, uh, an example in the Royal Collection here, this is a Cuvette de Marron, shown here on the left, uh, made by the designer and gilt bronze manufacturer Jean-Claude Chambellan du Plessis. Uh, and he, it's thought that he might be connected with the design of certain gilt bronze mounts. Um, for example, these. Uh, and there are a number of mounted pieces in the Royal Collection which seem to support this, to my mind, eminently sensible hypothesis. Uh, it's probably worth pointing out here that the bodies of the porcelain uh, on the right are pierced only at the, um, at this, hang on, where's the pointer? Yeah, just, just here. That's the only place where those bodies are pierced. Um, they're designed generally to fit around the body uh, and um, it's, it seems to be something that Duplessis as a, as a designer and as a maker uh, tended to achieve or certainly wished to, uh, to achieve. Um, but it's not possible at this stage uh, to say with any degree of certainty, unlike Charlotte's exhibition on Gutierre, which of course we're all very excited to see, um, uh, but maybe Duplessis could become next, um, uh, to see whether or not there's a, uh, a, 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 any attributions can be made with any um, uh, certainty. Um, but in the course of cataloguing, I came across a number of mounted porcelains which seem to have been made in a particular way, somewhat distinct from other less refined mounts. Um, in my view, there are a number of distinctive elements in the facture and the design, two separate things here, uh, of this and other pieces. Um, and they, I think, point to a common working practice, perhaps diagnostic of a designer, uh, or a maker, or a workshop, uh, or all three, perhaps. Uh, so in design terms, I would like to suggest that there is a symmetricality, a symmetrical design combined with Rococo decoration, um, a use of forget-me-not flowers, uh, a double-layered shell, uh, which you can just about make, up, make out uh, at the top, um, and a similarity, or at least a connection to, say, of porcelain designs, and I hope you can see uh, that's pretty obvious here, both in the foot and, of course, in the profile of the upper edge. Uh, in terms of facture or the making of the piece, uh, the porcelain often, as I said earlier, is not pierced, uh, and in some cases the maker uh, has gone to great lengths uh, uh, to avoid cutting or drilling the porcelain. Um, and a number of vases, uh, including this pair, in fact, on the right, are uh, fitted with a sort of simple foot brace or ring, um, which um, uh, occurs on a number of uh, other pieces, uh, which I think are also by this maker. Um, some mounts are also fitted together, not by means of brazing or soldering, but by a barrel and pin hinge, uh, which allow for easy or safe removal. Uh, these are merely observations of certain commonalities, uh, and it remains to be seen if a convincing argument can be uh, created uh, in support of a particular maker. So, once they were made, who bought them and why did they buy them? Well, some 18th century collectors, including uh, Jacques Savary de Brulon, uh, lamented that objects which had traveled far, uh, had traveled so far, had caused greater excitement than the equally noble creations of France. The Grand Dauphin himself, patron of the saint Cloud manufactory, surrounded himself with thousands of pieces of Chinese blue and white. Uh, much of it mounted in silver gilt and gilt bronze. But in time, the Vincennes Serre porcelain factory did, in fact, gain something like the upper hand uh, through increasingly ambitious designs and spectacular creations. It helped that the king, as owner of the factory, was happy to receive demonstrations of loyalty by means of purchases of Serve. But even Serve got in on the Chinese act, producing in the middle of the 18th century a series of vases copied from Chinese porcelain vases uh, which themselves were based on ancient bronze ritual vessels. And these were covered in a turquoise glaze, I'll show some of them later, directly imitating the bleu celeste glaze, one of the most desirable of, uh, of surface finishes. Um, all the great collectors in Paris in the 18th century, those names which cause in collectors today a quickening of the pulse, such as Louis-Jean Gagnac, Jean de Julien, Rondon de Boisset, the Duke of Aumont, uh, to, to, to name just four, owned large quantities of Chinese and Japanese porcelain. 
uh, though, much, though not all of it, in fact, was mounted in gilt bronze. And as we know, Madame de Pompadour was very fond of mounted porcelain and almost certainly gave a magnificent mounted vase, uh, which was recently uh, on the art market. Hang on, oops, sorry. Yeah, that one there, yeah. Um, and this was given to her friend, the finance minister, Macho Darnouville. Uh, this vase, uh, the mount's very similar in uh, design and factor to the pair of blue hexagonal vases I showed just a minute ago, uh, perhaps also by Duplessis. Um, so I should have shown these a bit earlier. These mounts here are made in exactly the way that I was describing with particular um, joins underneath these flowers here with a barrel and hinge. Uh, and you can see the symmetricality of the mounts uh, in both examples. Uh, and I would like to suggest that they may have something to do with, with Duplessis. So um, they, were caught, they were, of course, purchased for display. And uh, it's interesting that these vases occasionally feature as part of interior settings in French 18th century portraiture. Uh, here, a typically masculine interior of the first half of the 18th century with some mounted Saladin vases just about visible here on the top of the bibliotheque in the background. And here, some of you may know this wonderful portrait uh, of the painter's wife, rather interestingly, uh, from the recent auction in Paris of the late Robert de Balcony's collection. Uh, prominent in the painting is the lady's splendid silk dress, uh, accompanied, of course, here by a mounted Chinese pot, which I note has been transformed again from a potpourri into a flower vase, so mutability uh, crops up once again. And finally, this from the middle years, this from the later part of the 18th century, uh, the very well-known depiction of Marie Antoinette's friend, the Baron de Besenval, surrounded here by mounted porcelain, Chinese pieces on the mantelpiece, and Japanese pieces behind him. Well, while Le Tout Paris filled their hôtel particulier with these exotic pieces, it was slightly different in Versailles. The state apartments uh, in Versailles, even before the end of Louis XIV's reign, were bereft of Chinese porcelain, in spite of two embassies in the 1680s, one from Siam and the other from China. Uh, and th they brought with them um, and presented large quantities uh, of um, blue and white porcelain. But Stefan Castelluccio has established that, in fact, only after 1685, uh, it was in the private domains that Chinese pieces, including mounted porcelain, were permitted. And these vases here, of which there are four, were almost certainly ordered for the king through the French Compagnie des Indes, the French East India Company, uh, for the four corners of the private winter apartments of Louis XV. So this testifies to the fact that he did have mounted porcelain in his private apartments. Um, and, um, and specifically ordered from China for, for that uh, and form part, as I said, um, of a, um, for his breakfast room and matches a breakfast uh, service uh, delivered around 1738. But let us move on to the subject of the royal collection and in particular George, Prince of Wales, later George IV, who was very largely responsible for acquiring the mounted porcelain in the collection. Um, bar a few examples owned by his mother and perhaps some early pieces mounted in silver gilt which may have belonged to Mary II before her death in 1694. Why did he love them? Why did he buy them particularly? Well, with George IV, whose acquisitions had such a transformative impact on all areas of the collection, from Dutch cabinet pictures to Asian lacquers, Algerian weaponry or Indonesian daggers, it's not really possible uh, to know for certain what he was thinking or indeed what motivated him. Well, this is not altogether surprising, but for curators and historians, it is often baffling and not wholly clear. That he was interested in Asia uh, is clear from early projects at Carlton House, at the Chinese Drawing Room, uh, uh, which was published in Sheraton's Dictionary in, in the 1790s. Uh, and this, of course, was later swept away uh, in um, Carlton House and over, entirely overshadowed by the great project at Brighton, the Royal Pavilion. And here, this is the saloon at Brighton, uh, and in several bursts of activity, culminating in 1819, 1822, uh, he concentrated his Asian and Asian-like objects uh, in strange and colorful interiors. So he wasn't very, he wasn't uh, entirely prescriptive about uh, what he had, but everything had to have that sense of, of Asia about it. 
Uh, and in certain details, they do demonstrate, uh, funnily enough, a correct knowledge of Chinese visual culture and iconography. Um, but I must say the overall effect uh, was one of entirely European-inspired fantasy of Asia. And as a young boy, uh, the interests of two women may have influenced him, possibly even caused his fascination for Asia. Uh, first, his, sorry, grandmother, Princess Augusta of Wales, had commissioned Sir William Chambers to construct a number of exotic buildings in the gardens at Kew, uh, including the famous pagoda here, and the young prince would certainly have been familiar with that building. Second, his mother was fond of Chinese objects, and her sale in 1819 revealed a large quantity of Chinese objects, many of which were almost certainly presented to George III by the Qianlong Emperor in 1793 as part of the embassy uh, sent out there. Furthermore, a pair of lac Bogote vases was recorded by uh, the Prince of, uh, Prince of Wales's inventory clerk, Benjamin Jutcham, as having been presented to the prince some years before they were mounted in gilt bronze. Um, Sorry, here we are, there they are. Um, but the earliest purchases of, um, by George, Prince of Wales, of a piece of mounted um, porcelain shows to me, at any rate, that he was, hang on, I'm forward on from there, here we are, uh, that he was uh, fully confident in his ability to select a great object such as this one, or that he was very well advised. Certainly in the wake of the French Revolution, great quantities of paintings, Furniture, sculpture, and so on were being sold off in Paris and across Europe. And London was the leading market with plenty of ready buyers, led by the Prince of Wales. Was it the ready availability, the quantity of objects, and their relative affordability, combined with the very high quality of these pieces, which drove the Prince to make these spectacular acquisitions? A study of the early 19th century commercial art market for such objects would no doubt reveal certain patterns or trends but I suspect that George IV also longed to emulate or rival his French 18th century collector predecessors uh, such as the Baron de Besenval. Like many others in the prince's circle, he cannot have been insensible to the lure of the Ancien Régime, its style, fashion, demandé, anti-republicanism, and above all, the, uh, the, the melancholy romance of its all too tragic, violent, and alarmingly recent demise, the Prince of Wales entered into this aspect of his collection with great enthusiasm. And he acquired armfuls of uh, mounted porcelain, and I'm just gonna show you uh, 10 examples in two slides here uh, to demonstrate the range of his collection as well as the shapes and sizes. Uh, and these, I'm afraid the scales are very wrong. Um, these are very large, these blue vases here. Uh, they stand about three feet high. Uh, these, of course, very small. Uh, and uh, this I thought was interesting uh, because it's a very playful um, uh, vase with prunus blossom, um, but then it has these very austere but very beautiful neoclassical mounts. And also here, uh, a combination of fabulous objects, um, and you have a combination of very plain, uh, this is a very large object here, there's another one of these in the Getty and another in a private collection um, with, with superb quality mounts, probably, probably by Tomir, uh, but it has been in the past suggested by Gutierrez, but I think more likely to be Tomir. Uh, and of course this vase here was thought not to be Chinese at all, but in fact thought to be Sevres. Um, and then you have a Japanese pair of vases with French mounts and then on English bases, which we will come to in a moment. Uh, but I think the point uh, to be made here, with the exception of this very large piece, uh, which is actually dates really from the end of the 18th century, all the other pieces are much earlier in date, uh, is that the scale is quite compact. And I would like to suggest that this is a direct reflection of the spaces in French 18th century interiors in Paris, in which so many mounted porcelains were originally displayed, such as those paintings uh, depicting mounted pieces, which I showed earlier. They were, by and large, fairly compact. And as might be expected, the Prince of Wales appreciated these small, almost jewel-like pieces, but he needed larger objects to fill his large houses. Um, and at the Royal Pavilion in Brighton, and, and after 1820, when he became king, um, at Buckingham Palace uh, and at Windsor Castle, he commissioned some larger objects. Many of the larger pieces, almost certainly mounted in the early 19th century, are rare, 
and important uh, for the history of the evolution of mounted porcelain. 14 of these bottles uh, with overglaze enamels depicting on the right Taoist and Buddhist emblems were acquired at various points in the first two decades of the 19th century, uh, mostly through the dealer Robert Fogg. Uh, and four of these vases, uh, I'm showing you, obviously this is a pair here, uh, well, two pairs really, um, pair in the flowers uh, on the left and pair of the Taoist emblems on the right. Um, and they were sent for mounting to the Pall Mall firm of Valumi, clockmakers, dealers, restorers, and gilt bronze manufacturers, where they were given these extraordinary entwined snake mounts. And remarkably, the very detailed accounts which survive in the National Archives note that the snake mounts here were modeled from real snakes caught for this purpose. Well, those are the first four vases. Then you've got another two pairs here. Uh, and they're also these ones, uh, in fact, bought through the Valumis. Um, and I think these could well have, uh, could well have um, been fitted with possibly late 18th century um, gilt bronze mounts, possibly early 19th century mounts. It's very hard to say. Certainly this arrangement is, is, is rather awkward uh, to my way of thinking. And then again, more of these Taoist emblem bottles uh, with mounts here uh, with these cornucopia riverhead mounts, entwined snakes matching the ewers, but with, of course, a different bottle design. Um, it seems likely to me, through a series of complex associations, that the mounts on these vases were made in Paris at different dates in the early 19th century. I'm referring to this pair and the pair before. Um, the prince's or his advisor's eye was not wholly steady in connection with all examples of mounted porcelain. Uh, let us consider this set of three dragon vases, close in design to the famous pair of vases which had belonged to the Duke of Aumont, uh, purchased at his sale in 1782 by the dealer Payet on behalf of the king, Louis XVI, uh, and which later formed the nucleus of the French national collection, uh, which was to be at the Louvre. Well, it is not possible for us to know if the Prince of Wales was aware of the Louvre pair, but his various friends and advisers who went shopping for him in Paris might have known of them and thus inspired the acquisition of these versions. Equally, they may have appealed to the Prince of Wales simply on account of their dragon motifs, uh, uh, a motif found uh, throughout all, over, uh, all through the Royal Pavilion. Whatever the motivation, the mounts are almost certainly not 18th century, but early 19th century uh, of inferior quality. Uh, perhaps supplied by the dealer Edward Holmes Baldock, uh, whose name has suffered in recent years as an inconvenient improver of pure objects. And that may be true of some of his more imaginative reconstructions of furniture with which he is associated, but in the field of mounted porcelain, he was merely following the same activity as his Parisian predecessors, such as Duveau, Hébert, or Daguerre. While the method followed by Baldock and others like him had not changed in years, the finish and quality most certainly had, and this was confirmed to me when I took the opportunity of placing the Royal Collection vases, this pair here, um, or one, actually I took one of them, one of the ewers, um, uh, and placed them beside an identical dragon mount um, uh, with a, uh, on a pair of vases being offered for sale at Christie's uh, with a foot rim bearing a, a crowned C mark, and the startling difference in modeling and in particular chasing was noticeable and immediately confirmed to me that the mounts on the royal pair were of lesser quality and likely to be early 19th century in date. In the absence of any documentation, we cannot know if Prince George was aware of the inferior quality, uh, or indeed if he was aware of the adaptations produced by Bulldog and others like him. He was, however, very much aware of another English manufacturer with whom he had close relations, and working on this part of the collection, has revealed fascinating aspects of the making of expensive mounted porcelain in London in the early first two decades of the 19th century. The Valumi family of clockmakers who supplied the mounts on this pair of candelabra were descended from Francois Justin uh, Valumi, uh, who had emigrated in the 1730s from Vaux in French speaking Switzerland. Uh, and he emigrated to London where he joined Benjamin Gray, the royal clockmaker. And after his death, uh, he took over the partnership and continued the royal connection with George III and his son, George, Prince of Wales. And the Prince of Wales's ample and varied demands in the realm of metalwork 
uh, uh, metalwork making and restoring were perfectly met by the Valumi family. <clears throat> they were conveniently located in Pall Mall, equidistant from Carlton House and Buckingham House, and while their organization was in fact a fairly small operation, they could call on a wide range of specialist craftsmen, effectively subcontracting individual elements of the work brought together by Benjamin Valumi or his son Benjamin Lewis Valumi's organizational capabilities. So what we see at this point in the early 19th century then is a distinctive British equivalent of the French Marshal Mercier method. As in the 18th century in Paris, it is not wholly clear who was actually responsible for the genesis of the design, but in the English example of the early 19th century, a certain amount of flesh can be put on the bones of the creative method of producing these pieces. In the Royal Collection, about 20 pieces of Chinese and Japanese porcelain were mounted in gilt bronze by the Valumis for George, Prince of Wales, for which invoices survive. These invoices, recorded in the account books of the Lord Chamberlain's office, document in summary detail the work in question and allow for precise identification. Additionally, and completely by chance, a number of the Valumis account books survive at the National Archives in Kew, a rather haphazard selection of documents, mostly dating from the 1810s. These included watch repair day books, an accountant's ledger, details of loans from banks, and one volume of Valumi's great book, uh, which was another sort of ledger. While much of this sort of thing would no doubt be of great interest to economic and social historians, but what interests us in particular are the ornament books, of which volumes one to four survive, covering the years 1801 to 1815, and the ledgers of which volumes 29 to 34 survive, running from 1798 to 1814. Many, but not all of the pieces mounted in gilt bronze by the Valumis are recorded in these valuable accounts, and they reveal something of the organization of their workshop. The very wide range of the craftsmen involved in all sorts of stages, the costs associated with the elements of production, and the often very significant markup added to the final bill presented to the Prince of Wales. Let us examine two examples in detail. So from uh, <coughs> these marvelous things, uh, these come from Ornament Book 3, uh, dated 24th of December 1807, for mounting a very large red crackled china bottle in a very sumptuous manner made two very large winged imperial dragons, highly chased for handles, made a very elegant top to the bottle with a nulled edge and foot with a large hollow and double fillet molding and a circle of tamara or Japan lotus leaves growing round the base of the bottle. The bottle is fixed upon a very fine red marble plinth. The whole of the mountings of the bottle are executed in the first state of workmanship and very strongly gilt in the best manner in dead and burnished gold. Brackets made models of the dragons and patterns for the other parts at a great expense on purpose for this bottle at 50 guineas. Uh, and then goes on, made a very large blown glass shade to cover the bottle, four pounds 10, made a circular stand with a purple wood molding all round, covered with the best crimson Genoa velvet, so as to totally exclude the dust at two pounds and two. Uh, neither the stand nor the glass shade survive, I'm afraid. And then, so that was of course the red vase, and then very similarly, the blue crackled china bottle uh, in a most sumptuous manner, and so on and so on. Very, very similar circle of Tamara or Japan, lotus leaves growing around the very fine green marble plinth. Um, mountings are executed in the first style of workmanship, strongly gilt in dead and burnished gold. I think it's very interesting the use of terminology here, dead and burnished gold, in order to show that, that, that variation between the, uh, um, the, the very bright areas uh, that you can see here and then these in what they would call dead gold. Uh, and, uh, and again, a glass shade and a velvet covered stand. So the total for both bottles was 120 pounds and six shillings. So that was the amount charged in the invoice to the Prince of Wales. Uh, and that account survives in the Royal Archives and also in the Lord Chamberlain's uh, accounts. Uh, in Volumi's own account book, and this is the interesting part, uh, which noted the individual craftsmen at each stage and what they were paid. So here you go into real detail about how this uh, craft, this workshop was working. Smith was paid three pounds for the model of the dragon. Brownlee was paid 11 shillings and fourpence for the wood for the patterns. Barnett was paid one pound 16 for the casting of the dragons. 
Cowling was paid £1.12 for the riffling, or, which is the chasing, that is the finishing of the mounts. Uh, the bodies, um, and slightly more, £2.80 for the wings, £2 for the leaves around the base, uh, and so on. Seagrave, the gilder, was paid £13, so quite a, quite a large jump, but presumably this uh, higher charge included the cost of gold leaf, and so on. Uh, and included Fogg, the dealer, for cutting a hole in the base of the vase. The total cost of production for each vase amounted to approximately £40, meaning that the volumes applied a 50% markup, taking the cost to £60. In the case of the four large snake vases, those ones, if you remember, I showed a bit earlier, the cost to the Prince of Wales came to £1,680, but the cost of manufacturing totaled just over £1,000. There are a handful of pieces uh, where it is possible to uh, to compare the cost of production with the presented invoice, just as in this example. But the accounts also record the range of activities undertaken by the volumes for restoration uh, and regilding. Um, and sorry, regilding features very heavily indeed. Uh, and from the same le ledger volume, these vases here uh, uh, appear in April 1810, which I think is the earliest date that we know that they arrive in the collection. Uh, and here they state for unmounting a pair of very large china bottles mounted as ewers with a great profusion of very rich, large, and heavy chased ornaments uh, and repaired several pieces that were broke, made good in the fastenings, and so on. Uh, unmounting the pedestals, the bottles stand upon them repaired, 10 pounds. Um, again, next line, for regilding the whole of um, <clears throat> the, the whole of the whole of the large, heavy ornaments of the bottles, and the whole of the stands in the best manner. Uh, and that was charged at 150 guineas, um, and so on. And the total cost for, uh, <coughs> for working on these in 1810 was 347 pounds, uh, just for restoration. But um, other instances, uh, because Volumes' account books uh, survive um, only covering the period up to 1815, a number of objects, uh, and these included here, uh, remain only attributed to Volumes, although the gilt bronze mounts here are so strongly reminiscent of other work known to be by the Volumes. Uh, and this example here was uh, almost certainly supplied in about 1819. These, these six enormous uplighters originally situated in the music room in the Royal Pavilion, and when Royal Collection Trust conservators restored them, they found uh, volume account books cut up in strips and used as wadding to hold the spode porcelain plaques uh, in place in the pedestals. So these, these um, here we are, if I get the light here, these spode plaques were held in place just by um, cut up strips from volume account books, which is about as good an attribution, I think, as you can, you can want for. Um, but I think Volumes mounts, and this is a good example, uh, are fascinating to, to handle um, in contrast to the magnificent sculptural examples fitted to many of the great French 18th century mounts, uh, such as those, for example, the French, um, those powdered blue vases here at the Frick. Volumes mounts, however, have a mechanical quality to their factor, and this is not to denigrate them as individual works of art, but they are unquestionably made uh, in... Um, in an industrial tradition, one which was beginning to take shape at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century. The finishes of the mounts combine matte and polished surfaces, contrasting with milled, lozenge-cut mouldings to give depth and interest to the entire assemblage. And the reverse of the mouldings are painted black, uh, and some of the large, which is very unusual, some of the larger, very large mouldings bear traces of industrial-type finishing, Evidence, no doubt, of the subcontracted workshops used by Volumi and of the new technologies for creating these remarkable objects. These objects uh, have rarely been out of fashion. Collectors continue to this day to place a high value on these extraordinary objects. But after the great crescendo of George IV's collecting of these pieces, which came to an end with his death in 1830, the creativity and invention so prevalent in the 18th century rather petered out. Mounts continued to be made for porcelain, lacquer, and papier-mâché vessels, some on a very large scale. But the high water mark achieved in Paris in the 18th century, and I would say the early 19th century, was never regained. Instead, 
Collectors in the Rothschild mold took up the reins once again, collecting mounted porcelain and Kunstkammer objects. Throughout the 19th century, the antiquarian spirit and lure of the Ancien Régime, which had inspired George IV, dominated these collectors' impulses, including Henry Clay Frick and others like him. These objects, while subjectively, are undeniably beautiful, but perhaps only to Westerners' eyes, are complex entities whose adaptors, the merchants and goldsmiths, exploited the exotic, exciting, and above all lustrous porcelain material and adapted it or made it adaptable for a particular type of European interior. This new mounted creation is therefore reflective of its own original setting, almost always now lost, and also of its commissioner or designer, and perhaps also its owner. Ultimately, the broad sweep of the history of mounting these precious, strange Asian treasures presents a largely unchanging view of Asia, namely one of exoticness, of aggrandizement and adaptation by the addition of metal mounts, and of surfaces. The lustrous, translucent and magical medium of porcelain is combined with richly gilded and subtly varied gilded metal mounts. If it is possible to summarize George, Prince of Wales's approach to collecting and patronage, in this important area of his life, it might be that he was both looking back to the great collectors of 18th century Paris, Aumont, Guénard, Blondel de Gagny, and so on, and also looking forward in his patronage of Valimy in the creation of a new British equivalent of mounted porcelains, one which inspired his fellow collector, Viscount Lassels of Harwood House, but ultimately died with George IV in 1830. I think also George pursued exoticness further than anyone before him had done, matched only perhaps by his contemporaries, William Beckford and Thomas Hope, that he elided the concepts as understood in his day of China and Japan, and the objects made there as seen in his interior arrangements, underlines his desire for a unified exoticism made in his own image in Brighton. To conclude then, if we return to the 18th century in Paris, the world of the Marshal Mercier and, and the wealthy patrons, the very act of mounting Asian porcelain vessels, that is to say, fitting them with metal mounts made in Europe, subverts our contemporary notion of what is considered a work of art or craft, which in a general way must be some sort of unified concept of an object. To break apart or cut up an object is to denigrate it, to deny its originality, and to compromise the creativity of its maker. Ultimately, in today's globalized, connected, and post-colonial world, it begs the question, can the culture which altered such an object in fact respect the culture which produced it? And how does the later collector of the object view the culture which made it as a piece of European mastery or a specious Asian fragment? I would argue that the preciousness, expense, and fragility of Asian porcelains demands a closer inspection. In fact, by adding mounts, they were merging these objects into their own cultural settings. Many Asian porcelains in Parisian collections in the 18th century were not mounted in gilt bronze, suggesting an alternative view might be justified. And many were fitted with mounts, which leave the porcelain intact. I would like to suggest that the mounting of these vessels goes beyond the idea of the frame, or the paragon, as was recently suggested by Anna Graskamp, but in fact brings parity in materiality, balance in shape, form, and design, and harmony in the composition and reading of an interior space, allowing these objects to be understood as European and Asian fusions of creativity. Thank you. <laughs>